as you can see, the fight is on. The fight is real. The fight is real. The fight is painful at times. And the Bible actually says in John 10.10 that the thief, is the devil, comes only to kill, steal, and destroy. And the, the reality is, is that there's no way you're going to be able to avoid the enemy. The, the, the enemy hates you. And you've heard me say this before, but there is a target on your life. There is a target where he wants to hunt you down. He wants to mess with your life. He wants to ruin your testimony, that marriage that you love. He wants to bust up those kids of yours. He wants them to go astray. That pain he wants to turn into something devastating. The devil is out to mess with your life, right? And the the truth is, is that, we can have these attacks on a regular basis. Now, I've heard some people go to the extremity of the stuff. Uh, you know, they're using their pen, uh, and uh, you know what? The ink runs out, and next thing they're trying to cast demons out of the pen. Uh, no, it's just ink that's run out of your, uh, your pen, right? That was not the devil. Just get a new pen. That's what you've got to know. But, but as I said, the devil has got a target on your life, and he's out to completely destroy your life. And a lot of people may ask the, the question, well, will the devil ever t- attack me? Uh, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. And, and, and so what we want to do is we kind of want to equip you uh, to, to fight and equip you to win the fights. That's what we want to do in that place. And, and people are going to say, well, I don't want to hurt the devil. Well, guess what? If you don't hurt the devil, the devil will hurt you. And so it's important that we actually are on the front foot of this and we just smack the devil on a regular basis so that he knows that if he messes with you, uh, then uh, he's going to have uh, havoc in our life. And so uh, what we're going to do is we're going to discover, we're going to push in a little further today. Last week, we talked about who our enemy was. We talked about the weapons that he has against us, but then we looked at the commander-in-chief of our army. We're talking about God Himself. We talked about how big He was, the weapons He's given us, and the promises that He's given us so that we can have victory in the place. And so that's kind of what we did last week. Today, uh, we're going to be looking at a character. His name's David. David, uh, a shepherd boy that became king, uh, has to get into a few fights uh, with a few enemies that were in his life. We're going to look at his life. We're going to look at some of the strategies that he used to win the fights at those times. So my message to title today is called War Tactics. War Tactics is what we're looking at. And uh, I have my parents here, by the way, uh, all the way from New Zealand, right? For those that don't know where New Zealand is, some people have told me it's somewhere new in Europe, is it? Is it somewhere in Russia? Somewhere around? No, it's down the bottom, right? Right. For those that have no idea what happens outside of Texas, there's a country on the bottom of the planet, New Zealand. That's where they're from. Please go and say hi to them. But because they're in town, I found myself, while I was pulling this message together, all these thoughts and all these memories of my childhood, a bunch of stories from back at that time, are going to come up. So uh, let's get to this. Father, we're excited about your words. We're excited that you are about to show up in great power in this place. We thank you, Father, that you've given us weapons and promises to conquer, to destroy, and have victory over the devil. Father, we ask, God, that you'd speak to us today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, snap a high five with the person next to you. Tell them they're awesome. They're amazing. Well, there are real awkward ones going on there. Wow, these high fives, typically there's snaps around the place. And, uh, but anyhow, Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 1, it says, For everything there is a season, a time for every activity under heaven. If you go down to verses 8, it says this, A time for war and a time for peace, right? So, so according to this particular scripture, it says there's a time for war. Another translation may say a time to fight, time to wrestle, that there are moments that, 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 that are actually appointed to fight. And what I wanted to do today is uh, I kind of wanted to talk about uh, are there moments where we can anticipate warfare? 
Like, like if I could kind of know when warfare is going to turn up, then I can be ready for it. Wouldn't that not be helpful? If we could show you through Scripture, we could throw show, show ways for us to anticipate when things are going to come in our direction, then I can kind of be prepared for it. I can kind of know what to do so I can smack the devil before he smacks me, right? Now, now there are going to be moments, and there have been moments, that you've had moments that I've had where you kind of walked around the corner and you walked into warfare. You didn't expect it. And I've discovered the hardest punch to take is the punch you didn't expect. When it's just like, man, I didn't expect that today. I woke up today, and I was kind of thinking I was going to have a good day. I was kind of, I was going to have some fun today. And, uh, but, but, but the devil came and smacked me. I'm not feeling too good today. I'm kind of, kind of feeling beaten around a bit. My headspace is not kind of too good at this time. The hardest punch is the one, and so... I want to, before we talk about the anticipating moments, those, those moments where you can kind of plan for, uh, but, but when he shows up, uh, what, what has God given me? I want to know because rather than me lying down on the ground in the fetal position, defeated, feeling like I'll never get through the situation, feeling like he's now got the upper hand, what is it I can do? And the devil shows up and uh, I'm not ready for it. Well, the best way for me to explain this was the story I was 16 years of age. We had a dog, a Rhodesian Ridgeback, whom we called Kizzy. Uh, and, uh, but we ended up calling him Jesse for whatever reason. But, but, but we had this, this, this dog, a Rhodesian Ridgeback. They're the dogs that have got the mohawks down the back. And when they get angry, that mohawk gets a little bit higher. Anyone know the ones I'm talking about, right? They've known that, that three of these Rhodesian Ridgebacks have been known to actually take down and kill a lion. And so when Rhodesian Ridgebacks kind of get a little bit angry, a little bit upset, they can look a bit mean. <laughs> I mean, it's just uh, one of those things. He was a great little guard dog for us. Well, a friend of mine had just uh, got a puppy, and I was going to take my dog over to his house. And so uh, I'm walking from my house to his house. We had to go through a... Um, an alleyway. Do you understand what I'm talking about? An alleyway it was a, a, a connecting alley. That, but, but this particular alleyway, most alleyways, you can look straight down it from one road to the other road, right? But this particular alleyway, just around the corner from a house, had a bend in it. So you would have to walk down it a bit, then you'd have to turn uh, to get the other side. So, so what happened on this particular day, I've got my dog, Jesse, on leash, and uh, I'm walking down, and what happened was, as as I, I get to the bend, as soon as I turn the corner, there were two guys there. Two guys, beer bottles, uh, cans. I mean, they'd been there for a long time. And I recognized very quickly that I'd walked into a situation that was not good. It was an intimidating, you know those moments where you walked in and without them even saying anything, you know you're in trouble. That was my moment. So it was a moment I, I walked around the corner there were two guys. Now, I was in a situation. I had my dog on the leash. Uh, I, 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 my dog immediately knew that I was in a bad situation. And so he started to snarl. He started to bark at that time. And what happened was in that moment was these guys turned to me and said, bro, what are you here for? And, uh, and uh, I, I, I'm, I'm standing there and, and my dog, because he knows I'm, and the tone of the voice and the way he was intimidating me, my dog is getting upset. He's barking. He, he's looking angry. I, I had to move from the leash to holding on to the collar. And uh, these, these guys, now there was a guy that was probably three years younger than me. I wasn't concerned about it. There was another guy there, though, who, who as far as I was concerned, bigger, stronger, uglier, uh, and meaner. I, I mean, it was just one of those situations where, I'm not getting out of this. He wants to punch my head in. And, uh, and my, my dog, I mean, he, he's, he's ready to take, he's obviously waiting for a fight. You've you got to understand, I was raised in a region where for fun, they would beat you up. But lunchtime, you don't just go and eat, you go and eat, and then you beat someone up. That was the region I was raised in. Uh, I remember walking home from school many times and seeing a group of guys on look, looking for someone to beat them up, right? It was just what I had to go through as a child, right? And so I may be painting a bad picture. It's a beautiful place. It was just this particular area. And, and what happened was, I get told off by my mom afterwards. I know this. But anyway, I, I walked around the corner, and he's intimidating. I know he just wants to have a fight. He just wants to. And there, there's no way that I can do anything. My mate that had the little dog, 
He ran off. He ran off the other way. He didn't want to be a part of it. I'm now caught there. My dog. <laughs> like, I've, I've got them. My dog is now lunging up on its front. And, and, and literally, I'm, I've got a hold of him. Like, and he, he's jumping towards this man. That This guy said to me, I mean, he's got a bottle of beer. He goes, bro, you better get that dog off. I'll smash this bottle over his head. And I, I said to him, I said, I said, bro, I said, if you don't back off, I'll let this dog off and he'll bite your head off. Well, you know what? Eventually that guy saw how mean, he saw how uh, angry, he upset my dog, how vicious my dog looked. He backed off and I got out of that situation. Now, I'll tell you that story, but, but I, I kind of, there's some parallels here that I found that uh, you, you kind of need to know about, but, but I, I kind of discovered this, that man, if I'd listened into my dog, it was kind of like my dog was saying, man, you touch my boy, I'll bite your head off. You don't touch my boy, I'll bite your head off. Like, man, if, I could, if, if only you could speak, uh, you know, a bit of English at that time, but man, that dog, he was, he was looking pretty upset at that moment. He's protecting his boy at that time. But there are three things that got me out of that situation. Number one, the presence of something next to me that was bigger and stronger and nastier than me. The second thing was the name of what was standing next to me, that dog. I mean, it's, uh, and, uh, but I had standing power. I wasn't going to back down. Let's, let's have a look. When the enemy shows up unannounced, three things coming up on the screen, right? Remember who's standing next to you. And when you, you walk into a situation uh, and unannounced the enemy shows up, it's easy for you to back down. It's easy for you to, to get freaked out. But you've got to realize and remember, man, you've got someone bigger, someone stronger standing. You can't see him. But come on, the Holy Ghost, the all-knowing, all-powerful God is standing next to you. That's when boldness comes upon you. Come on, man, you hearing what I'm saying? And I, man, I, I can just hear the Holy Ghost at that moment said, you touch my kid, I'll bite your head off. You don't touch my kid, that's my boy. Right, man, I can just hear the Holy Ghost, man. You need to know that, man, he, he's, he's, he's more than your big brother. He's your bodyguard, and uh, he doesn't want you defeated. He doesn't want you knocked out. Come on, just get bold because you've got someone standing next to you, right? The B Bible promises that he'll never leave you nor forsake you. That's good news. I, I'm a mess. I, I've made a mess. I, I, I make mistakes. Come on, show of hands if you've ever made mistakes in your life. Come on, not a hand in this room. Should be down. We've all messed up. And so often we feel like I cannot, uh, I, I can't trust or I don't know if God's there because I messed up last week. I messed up last month. Last night I was, uh, you yeah, know, was, it was a bad moment, God. And we kind of Maybe think that God's walked away. No, He promises He never leaves you nor forsakes you. You need to know that. The other thing is the Scripture says that greater is He that is in me than he that's in the world. And so when the devil comes unannounced, come on, get bold because you know you've got God on your left and your right. When my kids mess up, I don't walk away from them. I'm just gonna say, you know what? Okay, let's get you back up on your feet again, but I'm standing next to you no matter what in Jesus' name. Hearing what I'm saying. The second thing is this, is that you've got to use a name that's greater than any other name, right? And so there's, sometimes there is, I mean, you just use that name. It says in Philippians chapter 2 and verses 9, it says that God elevated Jesus to the place of the highest honor and gave him a name that was above every other name. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under earth, and every tongue shall declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Come on, come on. Here's, here's the thing is that, you know what? Uh, when I pray, I don't just go, well, Father, I, I pray that you'd heal me in God's name. I don't pray, Father, uh, would you take away uh, that sickness in His glorious name. No, I pray, Father, heal me in the name of Jesus. It's a name that's above every other name. And every demon and devil in hell knows that name and they have to back off when you use that name. It's a great name. The third thing is this, is just keep standing. God, to just keep standing. Ephesians chapter six and uh, verses three and four. Now, by the way, uh, when they wrote uh, the, the Bible, they didn't write it in English. I know that might surprise you, a few people in this room, but, but the, you know, the Old Testament written in Hebrew, the New Testament written in Greek and uh, Greek and uh, takes a geek to, to understand Greek. But, but, but here's the thing is that 
the, the thing is with the Greek language is that they don't have the punctuation. They, they didn't have verses uh, one and two, so they weren't in there. And so they kind of, when they translated, they had to kind of think, okay, we're going to put a comma here. We're going to put a full stop here, start a verse here. But, but it's interesting, this particular part here, in Ephesians chapter 6, 13 and 14, it says this, after having done all to stand, stand, all right? After doing all to stand, we stand. And so, so here, here's the thing, is our job is to stay standing, when that intimidating devil comes, and when he comes to try and, try and bring us to our knees, to knock us out unannounced, come on, he wants to get you in, in a place where I'm down and out. Come, come, here's the thing is this, we're gonna stay in a standing position. Well, what happens if I get knocked down? Well, Proverbs tells us that. It says that though a righteous man fall seven times, he will rise. And so I've discovered one of, the, one of the biggest things that you can do to the devil is just stand back up again. And I look across the place here. So many people have been knocked off their feet. So many people knocked out in sin. So many people knocked out in unbelief and fear. And, and there's a bunch of stuff. Every one of us has been knocked down more than just seven times. But come on, well, the answer is the biggest kick in the face you can give to the devil is a man or woman that says refuses to stay down, says, I'm gonna get back up again. But, but, it, but it hurts, Pastor. I know it hurts, but come on, getting back up on my feet again, standing power, that's what you need. I need standing power. Ah, man, the devil hates it. The biggest fa- slap in the face is when you keep getting back up again. So, so that's what you've got when, when he comes unannounced. Three things that we're going to hold on to uh, at that time. But, but, but can we anticipate? Can we kind of plan? Can we kind of have an idea, seasons where he may show up in our life? Well, let's have a look at this. Number one. Now, the obvious one uh, is, is this, coming up on the screen, is that when you live with compromise or sin in your life. So you can anticipate levels of warfare in your life if there is compromise and sin that's in your life. Now, uh, what I'm talking about when I talk about compromise is that, okay, I got one foot in the camp of the kingdom of darkness and I've got another foot in the camp of the kingdom of God. If you stand in the middle of the road, you can get hit by cars in both directions. And so often people, they live with one camp over here, kingdom of darkness, kingdom of Satan, kingdom of light, kingdom of God. Uh, it can be incredibly painful. Guys understand this. If you're standing on a fence and you decide, I'm gonna put one foot in that property and another foot in that property, it's gonna hurt, All right? Come on, one person, one guy understands the rest of them. <laughs> yes, All right? Uh, but, but here's the thing is this. If you choose to steal something that's not yours, you, you're gonna feel the effects of that. The warfare's gonna show up. Now, now, this is just low-level stuff, but you know that the enemy is going to attack you with guilt and condemnation, when, and this is low-level stuff, but you can anticipate. If I step into sin, there are going to be consequences for those actions, right? Low-level stuff. But the second time that you can kind of anticipate warfare showing up is when you lack knowledge in an area. Now, if you step into something fresh and something new, your knowledge is down. Hosea 4, 6 says this. It says, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. So see, this is what the enemy does, is that when you're stepping into a new zone, it could be a new job, it could be a new business venture, a new ministry role, uh, shifting countries, locations, uh, any seasons of, of these taking place, there's gonna be a level of, of knowledge that you lack in. Well, the enemy just loves to come along and create confusion and create a heightened level of anxiety in in your life, fear, uh, thoughts, because you don't have the knowledge of it. So, so, uh, I mean, stepping into this country, not knowing, I'll call it bureaucracy, um, not knowing the the way they do certain things, uh, not understanding the immigration process fully, uh, I mean, it can create, the enemy can come and just kind of get in there, start whispering, start, you, you step into a business and you may not understand taxes the way the enemy can get in there and whisper, creating fear. So, so 
if you're stepping into an area and you lack knowledge in those areas, will you fight it by getting the knowledge? Become a student, read up, study those things. Get the knowledge that you need to make that happen. Uh, but then sometimes you just got to tell the devil, shut your mouth in Jesus' name, right? Number three is being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Being in the wrong place at the wrong time. So let's have a look at King David. Wrong place, wrong time. Uh, so so we, we know that one of the incredible kings, it was a, he was known as a man that had a heart after God. Uh, but what happened was, is that he had an adulterous affair with Bathsheba, got her pregnant, covered it up by killing uh, her husband. And as a result, uh, created some horrible things for him and his family and the nation at that time. But he, the second Samuel actually tells you the time that took place, right? I want you to have a look at this, right? If you get your Bibles out, Second Samuel chapter 11, and we're going to be looking from verses 1 through 2. New King James Version. I want you to see this with your eyes. I'm going to say it again. Second Samuel 11, 1 through 2. It's not going to come up on the screen, but if you've got your phones, pull it out. Anyone here got a one of those old school things? I think they're called paper Bibles. I remember those days. A few, there's three people in the room that have got Bibles. That's awesome. But but let's have a look at this. I'm reading from New King James, but read it for you. But it says this, right? Remember, wrong place, wrong time. It happened in the spring of the year, at the time when the kings go out to battle. And David sent Joab and his servants with him and all of Israel, and they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Reba. But David remained in Jerusalem. And it happened one evening that David was arose from his bed, walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof, he saw a beautiful woman bathing. And she was very, very beautiful to behold. And if you read on, you find out he behold her. And uh, that's where it got, rad, got bad, right? But I want to ask the question here right now. What time is the story? What time is the story? Well, well the natural time is springtime. But, but actually, the spiritual time, the appointed time for him, as it says here, note the words, the time when kings go out to battle. But David remained in Jerusalem. Wrong place, wrong time. David should have been out with his army fighting. He should have been out with the other brothers, the other boys, the other men, doing what he was meant to doing. But he sent them off and he decided to stay. And as a result of him not being in the right place at the right time, devastating consequences took place. So before we moved uh, to the US, we were living in Australia. Uh, before we planted our church on the Gold Coast, we lived in Sydney. We were youth pastors in a large church. Uh, some uh, Friday nights, we would get up to 500 teenagers show up in that place Phenomenal what was going on uh, in that place. That, that meant you got all sorts of different people showing up. You can imagine you had people that pumped, passionate for Jesus. And they would go, they would go to worship, they would go to be a part of everything. But then you had people that would show up. They, they were kids that obviously weren't allowed to go out to the parties. They were kids that uh, didn't, weren't allowed to go out with their friends. And so, uh, mom, I want to go to youth group, Right. So they'd get dropped off and they would play up, right? We'd have that or run off. We, we, we had a situation on a particular night where a mum had dropped her kid off and, and before she drove off, she noticed a girl that uh, was dropped off by her mum. She got out and she just stood there. Most of the kids got out of the car, ran off to their friends, but she stood there. She's a little bit intrigued for whatever reason of what was going on. And so she looked on and she just thought, I'll just stand back and watch this girl. And mum drove off, and about three to five minutes later, another girl turned up in the car and let her friend get into the car. She got in the car and drove off. Obviously, she had told her mum, I'm going to youth group. But in reality, what was going on was that she's getting dropped off, but her friend was going to pick up. They're going to go and do something. She's going to get back to youth group before it's all over. And then when mum comes to pick it up, youth group was awesome. I love Jesus, right? That, that, was, that was the story that was going on. Well, what happened was she gets in the car and she, mum, was that, in the car behind. The, the, the one She didn't know, but she saw something. I'll just follow them and see what goes on. Well, they pulled out of the church car park and they're going down the road. Music's blaring. Windows are down. 
arms hanging out the window, and uh, they're just having a good old party, in the, and she just happened to be going to say, I'll follow this car. So they went into a street that was very narrow, cars parked on either side, music blaring, the driver's not really noticing, and what happened was, unfortunately, was that, they now, now remember, the other side of the planet, they drive on the other side of the car, uh, and so uh, in the passenger seat, the girl that was picked up by her friend had an arm hanging out that window, hit the car, sideswiped the car, and, and, all, and, and all she could hear was a scream from the car behind. Now, normally you can't hear what goes on in that. That's how, how much pain she was in while she pulled over to help them out. Unfortunately, the arm was severed. Called the ambulance. Uh, the, the paramedics showed up, t- t- turned up to the hospital, and uh, there was nothing they could do. There, there was no way they could put the arm back on. Devastating consequences. Wrong place, wrong time. She was meant to be in the house of God. She was meant to be worshiping Jesus. She, she could have been in that day in a worship place with her hands lifted, worshiping the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Instead, she, wrong place, wrong time. And she lost her arm. The sad thing about the story is that she probably was 14 years of age at that time. Uh, 10 years after that, maybe she was going to get married. I, I don't know. But she's going to walk down an aisle one day and never actually have the ring placed on that arm. It, it's, a, it's, it's the wrong place. Wrong time. Uh, but I just want to say this is that, you know what? You, you need to know you're where you're meant to be. Don't, don't find yourself in the wrong place at the wrong time because the enemy will use you. You can anticipate if you step into the wrong place at the wrong time, there could be devastating consequences as a result of, of that. Number four is when you step into a new season. Go to Genesis chapter four. Genesis chapter four, one through seven. I'm going to be reading from NIV Bible this time. This is awesome. My, my God, when you step into new seasons, so you're transitioning, and life has lots of transitions. Uh, Luke and Summer, getting married, new season, right? You step into that. Uh, if you change jobs, it's a new season. You get a promotion in your job, new season. You start a new business. It's a new season. Transition is taking place. There's lots of transitions that we go through in life. This is when we can anticipate the enemy is going to attack us, right? Let's be pre- ready for this, right? Genesis chapter four, one through seven, Adam made love to his wife Eve. Let's just hold there. Okay, let's carry on. She became pregnant and she gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I brought forth a man. Now in these days they brought forth men. Today we bring through babies, thank God for that. Uh, that was a joke, Right? Later, she gave birth to his brother Abel. Abel kept flocks, Cain worked the soil, and in the course of time, Cain bought some of the fruits of the soil and the offering of his flock to the Lord. Uh, and uh, Abel bought his offering, fat portions of some of the firstborn of his flock, uh, but, but God did not look on Cain's offering with favor. So Cain was very angry. His face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, listen to this. Sin is crouching at the door. It desires to have you, but you, but you must rule over it. Another translation says, but you must master it. But, but I, I want you to see that. Sin is crouching at the door. Sin is crouching at the door. So, so I, I've had dogs that... That I remember one dog we had uh, in Australia, Sydney. He, I remember taking him to a field. He was just a puppy at this time. And I saw one particular time. He's off the leash. He's running around. And then one day I just saw him just crouched. I was like, what are you looking at? There was a burden right in front of him. I mean, I mean he, 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 was just, he was just crouched down. Just was a, and, and he was just waiting to pounce. Waiting to pounce on the prey. Now, he was just too slow for that bird. Uh, no meal that took place in that moment. But, but here's the thing, it crouches. It, it wants to pounce. Sin wants to pounce. The devil wants to pounce. He wants to get on top of you. But notice, that it, it's very clear here. Sin is crouching at the door. Now, what, what does a door do, right? I, I, I wish I'd have had a, a door that was right here. But, but, but see, a door is an access point from one environment to another environment. Right? I understand that, right? So, so if a door was here, this environment here has a certain layout, has a certain aesthetics to it. 
right? You, you step into the next room, there's another setup. If I come to your house, more than likely that every room is different, right? The, 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 the difference between a lounge and a kitchen set up differently, right? And typically you've got to step through a door. Now it may be an open door, but there's a step way. You've got to step from one environment. Sin is crouching at the door. It desires to have you. And it's in these moments of transition where, where he's at the door because you're stepping into a new thing. Because they're, 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 it's in those moments where you're stepping into a place where maybe you don't have all the knowledge. Stepping into a new place where maybe there's a fresh anointing on your life. That there, there's gonna be new temptations with new levels that we go to, but we can anticipate those moments where that's gonna happen, right? So, so I, I say these anticipations because now I wanna answer the question very quickly. Oh my goodness, look at the time. I wanna answer the question, well then how do, we, how do we fight the devil? Let's see what David did. If I could have some music, that would be amazing. First uh, Chronicles chapter 14 coming up on the screen. Verses one. Now, Haram the king of Tyre sent messages to David along with cedar logs, stonemasons and carpenters to build the palace for him. David knew that the Lord had established him as king over Israel and that his kingdom had been highly exalted for the sake of his people Israel. Now you've got this other king that says King David being established as king. And so he sends him gift of lumber, the workers to build a palace for him. That's a pretty good gift. I don't know. No one's ever bought, you know, built a palace for me. Probably no one in this room has had someone say, hey, I want to build a palace for you. Bless you. Good gift. And so this gift comes towards him. David, it says there that David realized, another translation, David perceived that God had established as king. And when I saw that word, I was like, how long? Had it been from the point he'd actually become king and the moment when he realized he was king? Because he'd been king for a time. When I looked into it and I couldn't get an exact time, somewhere between three months, and two years, it was hard to get it. I just had to go hunting, couldn't quite get it, but three months, two years. Two years is a long time. Three months is a long time. He'd been king, and then he realized he was king. And I was thinking about this. It's like, interesting. It's like he woke up one day, looked out the, the palace windows, looking down, seeing his, his kingdom, his subjects, and his army, puts on his royal robe. I'm king. I'm really king. It's so like a realization. How often do we have moments where our eyes are open? There was a moment I gave my life to Jesus. i have been a Christian a long time, but then I had a moment, it's like, I'm actually saved. I'm actually forgiven. You hear what I'm saying? It's like, I, I, I knew I was blessed, but then I had a moment, it's like, I'm really blessed. I, he said I was favored, but I can't, but I had a moment, it's like, man, he does favor my life. You hear what I'm saying? There's this gap that takes place. Let's carry on. Verses eight. When the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over Israel, they went up in full force to search for him. Well, hold on a sec. So the Philistines, the enemy didn't come and attack him. Not, not when he became king, but at the moment he realized who he was. Just know this, the devil's happy for you to live in ignorance. The devil's happy for you to just but when you realize stuff, it's a moment where he's likely to go, I'll challenge that. So when David heard about it, he went out to meet them. Now the Philistines had come back, raided the valley of Rephaim. David inquired of God, shall I go and attack the Philistines? Will you deliver them into my hands? The Lord answered, go and I will deliver them into your hands. So David and his men went up to Balperizim and defeated them. He said, as waters break out, God has broken out against my enemies by my hand. So that place was called Balperizim. The Philistines had abandoned their gods. David gave, gave orders to burn them. So when the enemy attacks, how do we fight? That's what we're gonna answer. We're gonna finish it up really quickly. When the enemy attacks, how do I fight? Number one is inquire of God. 
inquire. We're talking about prayer here, right? See, see, when we pray, what happens is we're inviting God into that situation. So when we pray, we're saying, God, I want you to step into the situation. The devil's coming, step into the situation. I need you to help me out at this time. Now, if you've sinned, easy, just repent. I messed up, God. I made a mistake. Deal with that, right? Um, last night, I'm putting these screens together. And I asked my mom to just have a look at this. And she, she goes, is that inquire, is it meant to be inquire spout with an E? Or is it meant to be I inquire? And, and so we, we, we ask Google because Google knows everything. And, and it's interesting what happened here is that inquire spout with an E simply means to ask. But inquire with an I, the way it's written in Scripture, is used for formal and official investigations. God does not want you just to ask Him, God, the devil's coming. Can you help me out of this one? Not with a knee. Come on, when the devil shows up, come on, let's, let's, let's have a formal investigation. See, what happens is our prayer life are shopping list prayers. We're telling God what to do. Fix my marriage, fix my kids, fix my finances. I've got a sore hip, heal me in that place. In Jesus' name, amen, we walk out. Prayer is a two-way communication. I talk, He talks, which means when I, I talk, I know He's listening, but when He talks, are we quiet enough to listen to Him? That's the inquire written here, here. We, we, we've, got, we've got to do that. We've got to inquire. Number two, get your sword out. See, in David's day, the weapons of warfare, they pulled their swords out. And in Hebrews chapter 9, 12, it says, the Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. It's sharp, it, it pierces to even die, divide in the soul and the spirit, the joints of man, and it judges the thoughts, the attitudes of the heart. So, so when the enemy comes, come on, pull that sword out. Pull the Word of God out. That's the Word. The Word of God is your sword. Number three, have faith that God will come through. Have faith that God will come through. First Timothy 6.12, fight the good fight of faith. Now what's a good fight? A good fight is one you win. You're not gonna talk about the fights you lost. You're gonna talk about the fights you won. Any brawlers here as a kid, teenager, anyone to admit to that? Uh, Baron's the only one to put out. John, your hand went up pretty high there. I wouldn't wanna mess with you either. Uh, but, but here's the thing. We have to trust that what God says He's gonna do. So 1 Chronicles 14, 10. So David inquired of God, shall I go and attack the Philistines? Will you deliver them into my hands? And the Lord answered him, go, I will deliver them into your hands. So David was boldly able to step into that assignment because he had heard God saying, go, and I'll deliver them into your hands. We have to have faith we have to have trust in His Word that He will come through with what He said He would do. And, and here's the thing, what we gotta do is when we're praying, so often we pray, well, that didn't work. God obviously hates me. God cursing me. I messed up last week. I stole someone's pen at work, didn't realize it, but God's cursing me. So I guess I'm gonna have to, no, no, God's not like it. Come on, we gotta pray. We're gonna keep praying. And we're gonna keep praying. When you're done praying, you keep praying. And when you're done praying, you keep praying and you keep praying and you keep praying until you, you get your breakthrough. And that's what happened. They went down on that battlefield. And what do they call it? They call the place Valparisium, right? Verses 13, once more, the Philistines. Now, before I go any further, what if the enemy turns up? I, I have my victory and they're getting some breakthroughs you have. Change your life forever. But what happens if the devil turns up? What happens if there's a counterattack that takes place in a life? Here we go. First Chronicles 14, 13 through 17. We're about to finish up. Once more, the Philistine raided the valley. So David inquired of the God, God again. And God answered him, do not go directly after them, but circle around and attack them in front of the poplar trees or mulberry trees, other translations say. And as soon as you hear the sound of marching tops and the popular trees, move out into battle because 
it will mean that God has got out in front of you to strike down the Philistine army. So David did as God had commanded him, struck down the Philistine army all the way from Gibeon to Giza. David's fame spread throughout every land. Lord made all the nations fear him. The enemy will show up with a counterattack. I don't know if you've been in meetings where you've been healed and you walk out and then a few hours later, oh, that pain back again. Maybe I didn't get healed. That's the counterattack. That's the counterattack because the devil, if he can get you into a place of unbelief, then he can rob you of that blessing, that healing, that breakthrough that's happened in your life. So, so if the enemy returns, what's the answer? Number four, come up on the screen. Inquire of God again. I wanted to say, as I finish up here today, don't fall in the trap of doing what you did beforehand. Don't fall into the trap, well, I attack the devil this way. I, I strategize, that's why I call this message war tactics, because I need to inquire of God every time the enemy comes in my face, when he comes to intimidate me. That's why we need to be people of prayer. It's not why we need to be people that inquire of God again. Let's finish off here. We're about to finish verses, verses 11. All right, why don't we stand? It says this. So David and his men went up to Balparizium. And there he defeated them. And he said, as waters break out, God has broken out against my enemies by my hand. So that place was called Balparizium. In other words, our God is the God of breakthrough. I don't know if, I, if you heard me here, but maybe you've had a week of fighting. Maybe you've had a week where the enemy's been throwing some shots. Maybe he's been intimidating about your business, intimidating about your finances, intimidating about your health, intimidating about your future. Enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. It's not a time to give up, it's not a time to throw the talon. It's not a time, come on, I just wanna say this, your breakthrough is here. He is the God of breakthrough and He wants to break through out against your enemy in Jesus' name. That's what it, Jesus is the God of breakthrough. Come on, I want you to say that after me. Jesus is the God of breakthrough. One, two, three. Father, come on right now, just close your eyes. I'm gonna pray. In fact, before I pray, what is it you've been fighting about? What's the enemy been wrestling you with? What's the enemy trying to whisper into your life? Could be in your finances, could be in your health, could be in some relationships. Bring it four right now. Could be anxiety because you are stepping into a new zone, a new season. What is that? Just know that He's the God of breakthrough. Remember, inquire with an eye. Formal investigation, God. With every eye closed, come on, just lift your hands to heaven. God. I ask that you would speak to every individual in this room. Speak to them in the name of Jesus. Give them the strategies, the war tactics to defeat the enemy in these situations.